And now I think I move on to introducing Penny and Andrew um, into the conversation. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and, and just give us some background as to who they are and where they've come from and then move straight into their presentation. So welcome Penny and Andrew. Thank you very much. We, we're really delighted to be here today. And um, I see we've got 34 people listening. So hello to everybody. These webinars feel a bit strange um, because we can't actually see you all. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm a GP um, and trained in public health. And I'm now medical director at Norfolk Community Health and Care NHS Trust and um, an innovation fellow, which is a strange name. And I'll tell you a bit about that later. Uh, and thank you again for the warm welcome, Beverly. Um, my name's Andrew McDowell. Uh, I'm um, a psychologist originally by trade. I'm one of the directors of the Performance Coach, where we focus on um, the application of coaching to all sorts of different problems and, uh, and, and areas. So my area is health. Uh, my background originally was in, uh, as an academic in teaching uh, behavior change and various things in medical schools. Uh, so, um, since moving to England a number of years ago, um, I've worked more specifically around the, the clinical application of coaching into the health coaching frame. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. So, um, what we're going to do, I think we've got now control of the uh, slides. So, what we're planning to do today is to talk about uh, why health coaching, what it is, what it does, and then hopefully have a discussion with some of you online about what your queries are. Now, we know, I'm just going to go back a slide, we know that health coaching is a strange term and many people don't really understand what it is and it sits within a whole gamut of other terms like shared decision making and person-centered care. So we, we wanted to describe what we think health coaching is quite carefully and we think it's empowering patients through conversation. But it does obviously link to all those other things that you mentioned at the beginning, Bev, and we will explain that. But we're going to spend some time talking about what is health coaching, what is unique to it, and where it dovetails with other things. So first of all, I just want to re-emphasize what we all know is that we have a problem. We have a tsunami of need. 58% uh, of people over 60 have one or more long-term condition, and there's an issue around inequalities because the poorest have 60% higher prevalence of long-term conditions and 30% more severity. And we also know that many people have more than one um, long-term condition and that the number of people with three or more long-term conditions is going to rise considerably. And the impact is overwhelming on our service and on us as individual clinicians. So long-term conditions account for 50% of GP appointments 64% of outpatient appointments and over 70% of inpatient bed days and account for £7 in every £10 of health and social care spend. So we know we have, uh, what we aspire to do is involve people in their care uh, and to take more responsibility. Um, but we also have to do it because currently things is not sustainable the way we are um, managing people with long-term conditions at the moment. Um, so we need to tap into their, what Simon Stevens calls renewable energy. I just want to go back to this, um, people have probably seen the Kaiser Pyramid before. Um, I think this is a really helpful way of looking at uh, the importance of self-care. You can see the green bit on the triangle is about the proportion of, of time people spend looking after themselves and managing their own health, but also the importance of uh, others. Um, social care, their families, uh, who also look after them. And actually when they come and see a professional, a clinician, um, it's a very small proportion of the time. And we know with limited budget uh, and growing number of long-term conditions that what we need to do is grow that green element because actually the funding available for the red element is going to remain the same. So it's actually imperative that we support people to look after themselves better. The question is how to do that. Um, and as a clinician, you often feel overwhelmed with patients. Um, and I have to say, as a GP myself, I just sometimes felt rather helpless in knowing how to support people to uh, make a change um, and to look after themselves better, particularly around lifestyle. 
And um, so when patients were coming to see me in my surgery, um, I often felt that um, my skills, I felt that my skills weren't necessarily up to the task which is why when I went on a coaching training, I thought this is a fantastic tool. Coaching is a process for empowerment, and this would be really useful for patients. So thinking about my own practice, but also looking at the statistics, we know that uh, when patients come and see their clinicians, only about a third to a half actually take the medications that we give them, and only 10% listen to or comply with the lifestyle advice that we advise. Um, for myself, I can say until recently I had very little training in behavior change, and this has also come out in other studies. So um, clinicians are not on the whole trained in the skills that we need to motivate people to look after themselves. And only half of patients feel they're sufficiently involved in their care. So basically alignment between what patients want and what is provided is poor their goals, treatment choices, and, and also making decisions together. And we know from the fantastic work from Kate Granger that um, you know, we really could communicate better with patients and that poor com communication often leads to complaints. Now, Angela Coulter, who you mentioned earlier in the seminar, has done some fantastic work. Um, and I think this is really true, and we know it really uh, when we see patients, that what she says is doing things to people instead of with them can be profoundly disempowering. It encourages patients to believe that professionals have all the answers and that they themselves lack relevant knowledge and skills and have no legitimate role to play in decisions about their care. Paternalism breeds dependency. And, and I think we experience that, that if we constantly tell patients what to do and if we constantly expect ourselves to have the answers for them and these answers aren't necessarily tailored to what the patient wants, then actually they'll keep coming back, which is what we find. So health coaching, I think, is a way of empowering patients. Um, instead of giving a, um, someone a fish, it's teaching someone how to fish. Um, and this is a useful definition, where health coaching is helping people gain the knowledge, skills, tools, and confidence to become active participants in their care so they can reach their self-determined goals. There are many different forms of health coaching and it's used throughout the states. It can be on the telephone, it can be in a group, it can be one-to-one. -one. People get referred to health coaching services. But where we've used it in the East of England and our training that we've developed, it is about integrating it into clinical practice. So it, health coaching, as we, as, as we have um, developed it across the east of England and now being used elsewhere, is combining a coaching relationship with behavior change techniques integrated with your clinical skills that support patients to achieve their um, self-determined goals, goals that are important for them to achieve themselves and hence them motivated um, to actually change. I'm now going to hand on to my colleague, Andrew, to go into a little bit more about what we do. Uh, thanks, Penny. I mean, I think what Penny's saying there about um, really supporting people uh, when they're working with patients or with anyone, really, to have a different kind of conversation, um, which is more effective at engaging someone in their own care, uh, is really at the heart of what the health coaching approach tries to do. And Penny also mentioned that there are lots of different ways of looking at health coaching. Bev mentioned motivational interviewing at the beginning, uh, which is one form uh, of the approach. Uh, but there is a need for some sort of consensus understanding uh, of what it's talking about. And uh, Ruth Woolliver is one of the leading lights for this in the US, and uh, she undertook a, um, a big systematic review of I think something like 800 articles, which she got down to about 300, to look at what is the definition of health coaching and what does it actually do. Uh, and what she's saying is that um, with all the definitions, what effectively uh, people are trying to get to is a different conceptualization of the clinician and patient relationship. So using a health coaching approach requires people to really define what the role of the patient is and what the role of the clinician is in a different way. Uh, she says that in all the different definitions, 
when you add them all together. What they're basically saying is we're looking for patients who can at least partially um, determine what their goals are, and they're engaged by the clinician in a self-discovery process in addition to some content education so that they can actually move and work towards their own goals uh, and using a, a, some sort of self-monitoring along the way to reflect on and learn about their progress uh, in addition with a, a stronger, more meaningful relationship with the clinician behaving as a coach. I think that the interesting thing about this is um, what does someone think about as a goal? So uh, in, in the many different trainings that we've run in the east of England and in other parts of the country, the challenge really for people is to, to for clinicians that is, uh, is to see beyond what their clinical goal is for somebody uh, and really um, understand what is it that's going to be intrinsically motivating for the person who they're talking to. So while you know uh, someone may a clinician may want someone to gain greater uh, control around their blood sugars if they're suffering from diabetes, um, a patient may in fact want to um, to actually just be able to uh, have a better quality of life in the way that they interact with their children or uh, in the way that they actually um, you know, undertake their daily activities. So um, we've had one example of a, a, a clinician who came back when they'd actually spoken to a younger person uh, around their, uh, their goal uh, through the conversations and using the health coaching uh, techniques. Uh, the patient's response was, well, actually, my goal is to be my own pancreas. Uh, to actually monitor my own um, uh, care in that way. So I think the, it, it means the, uh, the, the role of the clinician needs to change as well. Uh, it means that the clinicians need to be at least trained somewhat in behaviour change uh, and that they need to become better uh, at the motivational strategies and communication techniques that will lead to more <laughs> motivation uh, with patients so that they can work towards a more significant change. Uh, in their lives, and thanks, Penny. Uh, and in in terms of thinking this through, uh, what what this does is the it brings together a number of different areas. My work uh, originally was in the education of uh, of health professionals in university settings, uh, and we found that um, there were many many different models uh, that they could use, um, but they didn't always stick because there was often the clinical um, content. Uh, that needed also to to be to be explored. Um, so if we think about a definition of health coaching that we're using in the east of England uh, and uh, certainly with TPC, is we think about it in terms of bringing together the tools and principles and models from um, from health psychology and, and behavioural medicine, which actually can uh, incorporate all sorts of good stuff that we know really works with people. So we know behaviour change theory, we know there's fantastic tools from social cognition and patient activation stages of change, we know there are some motivation interviewing techniques and positive psychology techniques, um, there's a lot around mindfulness and CBT which have fantastic principles in there which when you put them in the context of a coaching conversation then you can actually get better results. So we train people to understand the principles of coaching, uh, things like goal setting and uh, the different models around coaching, the different ranges of directive and non-directive approaches, understanding the idea of potential and emergence, and using challenge more effectively with people, even the principles of scaling, to exploit and utilize what we know from health psychology and behavioral medicine in a way which integrates their health knowledge. It integrates what they have to do as part of their expert role so they can draw on their diagnostic consultation, questioning and listening skills to engage in more effective joint problem solving with people. It's really about them leveraging their patient and clinician relationship to be able to have a more effective conversation. That's why just using pure coaching, uh, the sort of coaching we might use in leadership and development, in a clinical setting doesn't really work. It will work to some extent, but unless you incorporate it into the very different role, which is clinicians are experts, they have knowledge and experience that they have to share, they have to manage risk, they have to actually work 
in a slightly more direct way. Um, and utilising what we do know from behavioural medicine and, and health psychology, then this together as a package is more effective. What we've seen is that in the... Getting into what's involved in, in the kind of development of people around the health coaching skills, uh, the key ingredients we've found that are really effective uh, involve helping people understand the foundations of coaching, so what it's like um, not used in a clinical way before they learn how to use it in the clinical setting. So we work with things around goals, using directive and non-directive approaches, different ways of structuring health conversations, and then really developing skills in listening and building trust, building rapport, uh, and actually using challenge in a supportive way, which is quite countercultural for a lot of people. Um, there's also a lot we can draw on from positive psychology and the use of understanding how someone's potential is always emerging. Uh, and then there's also what we know from the various behavioral medicine approaches around the readiness for change and managing interferences uh, so that we can actually land that in lots of different behavior change based health coaching techniques. Um, so the, the content is quite straightforward, but what we've found really needs to be included uh, to make it really stick with clinicians is much uh, is a very experiential uh, approach. So clinicians tend uh, to like uh, things which are fairly fast moving, but also with time to allow them to have a mindset shift. So the courses that we are using um, in the east of England and around the, the rest of the country are focused on having space in between the days to enable people to actually try out some techniques and actually practice coaching on themselves so that they actually see the impact of the change. Uh, there's also lots of opportunities uh, for them to use real issues, their own, their own issues, uh, as a way of seeing whether the skills are effective. Uh, so that, in, in a way, people coach themselves into seeing how the techniques and approaches are more effective than the traditional approach. Uh, so it leads us to a perspective around helping people develop new mindsets. Um, and at the heart of the, the coaching approach is the idea that you know, people are more resourceful than they think they are. And sometimes we need some time and space to help people access that. Now this is a, a terrific mindset that you can use in all your clinical consultations, irrespective of whether there's a behavior change interaction. And what's very, very interesting is that when we train clinicians in health coaching, they actually generalize that skill and they utilize it in their relationships with other people. So it's a leadership skill as well. Then there are various, tech, uh, various skills that people are using uh, in in health coaching, a lot of the listening skills, using supportive challenge, using empathy skills, which are useful in many interactions, uh, and holding the framework of, you know, using coaching as a mechanism for increasing people's awareness and, and their responsibility for self-management, um, those skills are relevant to most people. But then in, in specific situations where you're looking to get a behavior change, then there are all sorts of very specific um, health coaching techniques that you can use um, and structures in the conversation to support um, the actual change of behavior. So we like to think about it as a, a model where we use techniques and skills to help people understand the mindset which is underpinning the coaching approach. At the heart of it all is the challenge to clinicians of how they're actually seeing their patients. This is something I like to call bifocal vision. It's the idea that, you know, in many, many health situations, people feel like they're considered as a problem. Uh, and in fact, you know, people attend uh, many health services and care services uh, in a way where there's such a power imbalance, they do feel like a problem. Uh, what coaching asks us to do is to hold a bifocal perspective on it. It asks us to look at, are we actually seeing the people that we're working with, the people we're there to serve, as resourceful and holding the solution to their problems? And we feel that this is a, a very useful 
uh, realization for many many clinicians where of course that's the intention but just to actually focus on that routinely regularly uh, and in a disciplined way creates a shift in the interaction there's a massive social psychology and um, and, and health psychology research around the fact that the way we look at someone the attitude that we hold really does have an impact on the outcomes that we achieve Thanks, Andrew. Um, uh, one of our GPs who attended our program, um, she was a bit skeptical at first, but has been using these techniques. And I was just really um, inspired because she actually said, we said, what did you learn from the program? She said, I don't know we should do this. But she said, I don't, because I'm so busy and they're waiting in the waiting room. But she said, uh, before every patient now, I just check myself and just think, Am I holding that mindset? Am I thinking every patient that comes in through is resourceful? And it's really hard to do to just take that moment to think that even even the patients that I find most difficult, actually, you know, they 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 are capable and they want to um, look after their own health. Um, and actually, she said, uh, and it, you know, she said, I listen well. So a lot of my partners they send me patients. And she said, I was sort of like running late and feeling quite sort of overloaded by this. And she said, I had one patient who had COPD and heart failure, and um, he kept coming back. And, um, and, I, and I, said, I said to him, like, I, I thought, oh, I'll do one week, I'll do his COPD. Another week, I'll do his heart failure. I'll also talk about his anxiety. And she said, she came on the program, and she, she just thought, I'm just going to just try another approach. And she sort of said, what's important to you? Um, you know, where, where, where would you like to get to with our conversation? Um, how do you see your condition? He said, uh, you, keep, you keep inviting me back. And she said, well, I, I, I feel that we're not getting anywhere. He said, well, it's never been very good, my COPD, and I think it's as good as it can be. And then she said, but you don't seem very happy with your care. And he said, I've always been a bit grumpy and she suddenly realized that her expectations and his expectations were completely different and if she'd held that mindset about what is it that he wanted from the consultation and to ask him what his expectations were then you know she wouldn't necessarily had to work so hard at trying to fix him and it was together that they needed to agree a plan rather than her trying to solve his problem when he, actually he didn't see that he had one. And we've got lots and lots of other examples uh, of clinicians telling us stories about just stopping and thinking and asking more questions and being open um, when actually that's quite hard to do in a very, very busy day. And I think that that leads to, I mean, I have to, have to say that I'm probably uh, was um, culpable, but we can get into habits um, particularly when we're under stress. And I suppose what health coaching is doing and what Andrew was saying is about by holding that idea in mind that patients are resourceful, we can have a different approach uh, and be mindful of having a different approach to different patients that come and see us. So we've had all this feedback from uh, hundreds of clinicians that have come through our programs. Um, because this is an innovation and health coaching isn't for every patient and it's not for every clinician. It is an innovation and it started off um, with piloting uh, in Suffolk with um, practice nurses and then we moved to a two-day program and we've now piloted the training, a two-day training with over 800 clinicians or nearly 800 clinicians um, across the east of England, mainly nurses but also uh, physios, OTs uh, and doctors in multidisciplinary groups. Uh, 43 participating organizations um, include acute community primary care, mental health, and some social services colleagues. Um, and we have trained up 20 local trainers who are now rolling out health coaching in their own organizations to hundreds of other clinicians. Um, so we are growing our knowledge base. And Andrew is also working with other areas. Do you want to? Yeah, so we've worked with um, the deanery in London where um, we've trained some trainers and delivered to about 300 clinicians across the, the system together. Uh, in Leeds, they're doing a really exciting project at the moment where it's a city-wide project joining up uh, a council and a, um, a um, 
acute trust and also a, a community trust. Uh, and they're looking to create a system across the city where everyone can have a consistent approach. Again, the strategy there is to develop people who can roll the training out independently, which I think is, is the right way to do this. Uh, and in Wessex, uh, another exciting project like that where originally we worked around the idea of recovery uh, and rehabilitation, working with a, a ward to all use a coaching approach, and they found actually people were able to leave hospital more, effect more quickly and with less care package uh, and more safely uh, if they use the coaching approach. But now they're rolling it out again with a train-the-trainer model in order to actually develop people who can work across the system. Again, this is a local authority working with a community trust uh, and a, um, uh, a hospital to actually achieve that desired result. So across the country now, hundreds of people, in, in fact into the thousands now, are starting to use this approach uh, in a consistent way. So the question is, why is it, why is it catching on and, and does it work? Um, and in the East of England, we've done three evaluations to grow the evidence base, and we need to do more. Uh, and we've also um, done a rapid review. The first um, evaluation was done by University College Suffolk uh, with practice nurses, and we did pre and post coaching um, patient self efficacy questionnaires, which showed an improvement in self efficacy. Uh, after coaching. So self-efficacy is improvement in confidence and motivation to self-care. Uh, then we had feedback surveys, you know, um, I think we're all a bit skeptical of these, uh, after the program and six months after from the participants. But I think we were really overwhelmed with people offering spontaneous feedback about uh, their experience. Uh, um, and. Uh, I think it, it was 96% of um, people who'd been on the programs were thought that they were very good or good, um, and people used just to um, send us comments spontaneously. And then we're trying to get a little bit more depth and obviously more objective, and we've got the Institute of Employment Studies did a quality evaluation of five pilot sites uh, with in-depth interviews of 55 clinicians in focus groups. Um, and one-to-one uh, -one interviews. Um, and they found that two-thirds of clinicians were using their health coaching skills uh, with a positive outcome. Uh, and, and they interviewed from them for up to a year after the, after, the, um, after the training. So we've got a bit of um, evidence, um, and clearly we need to do more. And what, what uh, the uh, surveys and the Institute of Employment studies found was that actually um, the clinicians were reporting that uh, patients were more motivated to change and more confident uh, about managing their own condition, that they actually uh, found their consultations more satisfying, that they were, patients were more satisfied and, and expressing uh, their gratitude to the clinicians for uh, using a coaching approach and integrating that. Uh, with their clinical practice. And the clinicians were reporting some improved outcomes, for example, weight loss or um, patients achieving their own goals. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to measure outcome, and that is something that we need to focus on a bit more in the next phase of the program. Clinicians were finding that their consultations were more effective, and they felt more energized, actually, um, after the program. They felt uh, more resilient. Um, and uh, you know, one one clinician said, "Oh, well, now I can now I can carry on for the next 20 years," uh, because they felt that they weren't carrying the total responsibility and that they could share that with the patient. Um, and they had more satisfying conversations. And they were also using this uh, way of uh, having a conversation with colleagues, for example, in appraisal, uh, in their leadership roles. Um, because coaching is an empowerment tool, so the clinicians were using it to empower patients, but they were also empowered themselves. In their organisation, the, the, the two evaluations, the evaluations show that um, uh, health coaching can improve the quality of care, mainly through communication, which, as I mentioned before, is, can be a major source of dissatisfaction. But also, the clinicians were reporting that patients were coming back less that they were able to discharge them more quickly, and that they were listening and, and um, 
working together with the patients rather than just ordering a test or another appointment, really getting to the heart of the problem. Um, and of course, it's meeting strategic priorities for the organisation uh, and a key part of the five-year forward view. But also, as clinicians come from many disciplines onto each of our training programmes, they're actually understanding uh, what each other does better and it improves multidisciplinary working both within an organisation and across an organisation. And clinicians were reporting that they thought it was likely that it had uh, impact on um, the demand for services, costs and outcomes. Clinicians were also using it with a wide range of uh, different patients uh, with different conditions. And this uh, slide just illustrates the sort of whole spectrum um, around long-term conditions. Because it is a way of having a conversation, so um, it is very applicable to um, lifestyle, manage weight management, diet, exercise. We've had a lot of people from smoking cessation services coming on the program, and even a receptionist was using one of the techniques when people ring up to identify how ready someone was to give up, and therefore, whether it was appropriate, they actually see a stop smoking advisor. Um, it's very useful with people with mild anxiety and depression, um, and also um, to, as I said, give confidence around people's um, using their medication to improve compliance. Uh, in Wessex, they've used uh, health coaching with a whole rehab board with fantastic results, uh, really getting people um, more mobilised. Um, and also, there's examples where people use it in terms of end-of-life care, uh, focusing on what is really important uh, to people um, at the end of life. What do they want? Um, what do they want from their clinician and from their care? Um, we also looked at the evidence from multiple studies, uh, mainly from the state. Um, and these are difficult to compare to what we do because they are a referral service in many instances. Um, however, there are some themes, I think, that are generalizable. In the fact that, and I think that um, with my public health hat on, it's very, very important that uh, health coaching has been shown to support vulnerable groups and improve patient activation. Um, I think that is really uh, gives us hope that people who feel that they have no control through having a different conversation, we can enable them to take more control of their own condition. Um, and it can support patients' motivation to self-manage and adopt healthy behaviours. There has widespread application to different patient groups, as I just mentioned, and can be used by all professionals, but also peers. In our programme, we have been doing the training for clinicians. Um, and we have not yet used it with um, patient experts, but I think that is probably the next step. However, as we know from our program, we are growing the knowledge base, but we still have a long way to go. It is an innovation in the UK. It's been around uh, 10, 20 years in the States. Um, we really need to do a proper research uh, study um, of, uh, on costs and outcomes. I think uh, the other thing that um is evident from the research that's been undertaken in the east of England, is that in order for this to land effectively, to create a different way for people to have conversations with uh, the people they serve, is um, is really the clinicians need to be open to the change, and 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 many people are, and and what I what I see happening in the training is that. This is actually, and, and IES, the Institute of Employment Studies, concluded that actually a lot of what we're doing with the health coaching is a cultural change program as much as it is a skill development program. It enables people to reconnect with their values about why they do the role they do, what originally connected them to their, uh, their health profession, and the idea of really wanting to support and help people to have better quality of life. Uh, we know from the research that it's quite hard to change behaviours, we get into habits. Uh, we know for people they find it quite hard to challenge um, patients, it's uncomfortable and it's almost uh, at some level for some people it's incongruent with the role of helping. Uh, 
and then you know there's a new level of understanding that really helping is actually using supportive challenge to help people get what they want. Um, and it's also hard to know when to apply it and who with. Uh, we know that there's a challenge in terms of time so that the approach we use is about integrating the skills into the actual uh, normal business, not seeing it as part of a, a separate business. Uh, and then it's also about making sure the research shows that it's actually more, more effective to train teams of clinicians rather than just one or two people who go back into an environment where nobody else is using a different approach. It's quite contracultural. Uh, it's quite different to a biomedical approach, and it's quite interesting to see uh, various reports coming out at the moment, like the uh, CGP one on stepping forward, which is promoting uh, the real need for our workforce to develop more psychosocial skills uh, and to actually shift the way they're working with it. People are talking a lot about patient activation at the moment, uh, but our, uh, at the heart of our premise is, in fact, that uh, to get patient activation, you need clinician activation as well. We need people who are thinking differently about how they do their consultations and utilizing a, a much more strategic way of adopting different strategies for different people, not just doing the same old thing. So I know we've only got 10 more minutes and we want to take a few, a, a, a few questions. So I'm just gonna race through the next few slides and then we can just um, engage you all a bit more. So we are really delighted that uh, health coaching training um, to empower patients through conversations is one of the uh, 17 innovations chosen nationally to be part of a program to accelerate uh, this um, uh, training and really uh, and to study what it takes, what, what it takes in the NHS to get innovations into practice quicker. Um, so I'm really honoured and I feel I'm doing it on behalf of the team and Andrew, the team at the Health Education East of England to uh, work with UCL partners um, and uh, the Health Foundation and NHS England. And this, um, the, the National Innovation Accelerator Programme is to deliver on the commitments in the five year forward view around what are the conditions needed to get innovations into practice. Um, so this is a real boost to our program and uh, um, I, sort of, I think it reinforces the confidence that this is the way to go. And we're also delighted that other colleagues are now, like the Health Foundation, have now um, thinking about health coaching in their recent call, realizing the value. So what are the next steps now that we've got a vote of confidence, we've got a bit more evidence, we need more evidence. We've got some great feedback from our clinicians. We've got some great feedback from patients. Uh, and we've got a lot of good partners. And I suppose the, the question that we all need to ask ourselves with patients is, are we having the most effective conversation? And I mean, the reason why I, I'm really um, supportive of this is I was working as a GP in Suffolk for over a decade. And I can go to hundreds and hundreds of courses on heart failure or COPD or diabetes. And in that 10 years, I came across one afternoon consultation um, course on consultation skills. It was very good. But I felt that um, these are skills that I am using with every single patient. And while I may not know all the scientific evidence behind um, uh, all the science behind each different condition, I can do my best to have the best and most effective conversation with every patient that I meet. Um, so I think we should all ask ourselves, are we having the most effective conversations? Are we supporting people in the most effective way? Can we see their potential and help them to manage their, their, um, their health better? Um, it isn't for everybody, absolutely not. But for those patients who are ready for change, I think we maybe can do more. And these are the techniques that clinicians can use and have access to. So with the NIA program, we hope to um, um, uh, accelerate um, accelerate what we've been doing. Um, and we, we believe very strongly that our approach supports the house of care, that health coaching sits right in the middle in, in the person-centered coordinated um, care approach. It activates the orange segment, activates uh, the health professionals committed to partnership working. They're activated to go into their own organization and start championing health coaching and self-care support. 
and it activates patients. And what we need to do the next step is to think it's not just a training program, it's a catalyst for organisational change and what do we need to do to support the clinicians who are trained in their own organisations through changing the systems around them. So phase three uh, of the um, health coaching program in the east of England is to provide more training, to grow best practice through um, learning from each other, to support all our clinicians who've been through the training and particularly our trainers so that they can go out and uh, are unable to work and support more patients. We want to learn with other regions that Andrew went through who are adopting uh, health coaching through a learning set. Um, we absolutely need to do more research around health coaching and we need to make this sustainable and not just a pilot. So we're thinking about maybe having a national uh, website so that people can access all the resources. I think the, um, maybe a way of summing it up before we go into questions, Penny, uh, is to talk a little bit into what the vision is. And effectively, um, the idea of health coaching in terms of training clinicians in a different way of having the conversation is based on the idea of helping them shift from this tendency that many clinicians have to fixing and problem solving and coming up with the answers for people, telling people what to do with all the right reasons, uh, but to actually change that to be more enabling, to help them develop new skills in behaviour change and grow their ability to listen and build rapport with people. Uh, on the patient side, it's helping them uh, to raise their awareness and increase their sense of responsibility for managing their own health. So in that sense, it taps into internal motivations and helps them identify what they want. Uh, the goal being to support people and patients to actually change their relationship to the condition, to help them thrive in the presence of their disease and better manage their own health and care. And I think the, the one thing to add to this, I was coaching someone recently in a um, in a, in a setting in front of people um, and the, the patient was um, someone who suffered with MS and uh, she, asked, uh, they were, she was asked after the coaching demonstration um, what the impact of the interaction was for her and she said interestingly that um, this was the first conversation that she's had in 14 years of having an MS diagnosis where she talked about her diagnosis and ended with a sense of hope. And I think that's really at the heart of what coaching can offer people. It's can we help people access a hope that things can be better if they take control of managing their condition in a different way? Uh, and I think that's really what we're trying to achieve with this. But that was fabulous presentation and I think really fitted well with, with our WebEx on, on Monday. So um, while I just say a little bit more to you, I'm just going to ask if, um, if we can unmute Katie Clark Day who spoke on Monday about her experience. And <laughs> what did you think, Katie? How would that work for you? I thought it was really interesting. I think that last bit about changing the relationship with the condition and being coached to do that, it's really important. I think that we're empowered, the other emphasis on empowering patients at the moment, we need, if we're going to be empowered, we need doctors that are in a position to embrace the, the change as well. Absolutely agree. Do, do you want to comment back on that, Penny, for Andrew? Or? You know, we are, we are talking to doctors. Cook. You know, I think doctors, nurses, um, allied health professionals, you know, there's going to be some sceptics and they're going to some some people who are going to take it up straight away. So I think um, you know this is a growing movement. I like to think, and um, uh, and we need to do it collaboratively with our colleagues, um, recognizing that that some people it appeals to more than others. You know, I think also that very very few clinicians that I meet when they really consider this in terms of their values and why they got into doing the things they do, uh, will find a good reason to disagree with the fact that um, actually giving people a little bit more time and space, finding out what they want, structuring the conversation in a way which helps access their own uh, skills and abilities and, and intrinsic motivation, uh, it just makes sense. Uh, and most clinicians see that if you give them a bit of a time and space and in fact coach them towards working that out for themselves. 
Hi, I was interested. I'm someone who has um, long-term conditions, but I also um, do a bit of part-time coaching uh, for performance and development, but find it almost impossible to coach it myself. Um, but I wondered whether um, you were thinking of actually training, if there was any training available for, um, for patients with long-term conditions who were interested in becoming trainers, and actually so you'd get that kind of peer, peer support as well. Um, yeah, I mean, this, uh, we get this question a lot, and um, we would like to do that. I think we've had to uh, work very hard at developing the case just for training clinicians in the first instance. Um, that's why we're delighted to have this webinar. This has been a five-year journey for Andrew and I to get this far, so uh, we hope that as more people recognize the need for health coaching, that clinicians find it useful that we get more evidence that we can then go and support others and definitely um, working with people with long-term conditions as peer coaches would seem uh, you know the next step I think in terms of health coaching in the States we're just providing basic skills in health coaching for clinicians to integrate them with their uh, clinical skills but in the States, they have a whole range of coaches that with different levels of skill. So that is also another, you know, that are able to tackle more complex patients. So that's also not only working to broaden the different sorts of professionals and peers involved in coaching, but also the um, expertise that we hold in coaching. I think those are two, two ways that we'd like to develop. Brilliant. Thank you, Christine. Just Jenny, I think, has got the question that was burning in my uh, mind throughout the whole presentation, and you alluded to it a little bit at the, at the end. But I'll um, I'll just let um, let Jenny ask her own question. Jenny. Oh hi. Yeah. Um. I think you've probably answered my question, but it sounds really good, really interesting. Are there any plans to run it out nationally? Um. I'm in the northwest in Liverpool. So any, any plans with health education northwest? That's a good question, Jenny. We're, we're, you know, through the National Innovator Accelerator Program, we are trying to, um, I suppose, influence um, as well as support regions that are doing it and influence to enable other regions that aren't yet. I'm not in a position to say, but, but I hope so. I can't make any promises. I think the thing is, you know, if you've heard this presentation, and you feel that this is something that you would like to explore, then I think um, go and talk to people um, and go and look on the East of England website. Uh, there's lots of resources on there um, that you can use. The evaluations are on there. Um, application forms are on there. Um, so that is um, a lot of resources to help you make the case in your own area. And I will be doing all I can through the National um, Innovation Scheme to try and, and make this a national offer. Brilliant. Thank you. And Lynn, Lynn Craven, who... I have done similar work to this when I was involved with the Health Foundation's co-creating health project. Yeah. And I... I just, I mean, similar to Christine's question really, is patients make really good coaches for healthcare professionals because I think we add something real to the situations that, that happen. And I just would be really interested to hear about patients' involvement in your work. So, Lynn, we've been having uh, various conversations with different people about the possibility of doing that. Uh, if we go back to that three-circle model, which is around, um, you know, holding the knowledge and skills from, um, uh, from behavioural medicine, health psychology, putting it into a coaching format where you draw on the skills of the practitioner I think it's equally true to say that you can draw on the skills, the lived experience, the, uh, the uh, massive understanding and knowledge uh, that people with lived experience hold. I think there's a very, very strong rationale for working in that direction, um, and uh, we'd be very keen to look at that possibility. So far, the priority has been around changing the kind of quality of care 
uh, that, that clinicians offer. So I think it's uh, an important uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, highly useful debate to look at how we can actually include that. We've been having some conversations with the Coalition for Collaborative Care uh, about that possibility. Yeah. I mean, I just I think it's, that's really important that we include people with lived experience, both in our next phase of developing the offer, um, um, and also to explore whether those skills would be useful and whether they work. Um, I have to say, as a clinician working in the system, um, you know, I do think clinicians are under extraordinary pressure and that they need uh, the skill the skill set, the toolbox that this offers them to get through the day. Um, and uh, so I suppose where this is where it came from originally. Um, and, uh, and, and as it's grown and developed and we're learning all the time and we haven't got all the answers, then, then we can develop it further. Brilliant. Thanks, Lynn. What techniques did you use to engage clinicians to take part in the training? Well, at the beginning, it was quite difficult. <laughs> you might be unsurprised to hear. Um, <laughs> but I think usually um, what we now we can't, um, we're turning people away. So I think the thing is once people hear about its usefulness uh, and hear that the, uh, the congruency of the, of the teaching fits with the actual style that is coaching them into working out what's right rather than actually telling them this is the new way to do it because health coaching is just one part of the puzzle it's not the whole thing um, then you know people just flock to it so word yeah. of mouth is the primary reason primary way uh, and also teams of clinicians telling each other this could be useful for your area mm -hmm. so it's really social movement territory um, that we that we see starting to happen the other, the other thing is that Andrew and I have learned how to tweet. Not very well. No, we're rather bad tweeters, but um, there, you know, there's a, <laughs> it's great to connect with colleagues at the Coalition for Collaborative Care and uh, with Alf Collins, who is, you know, a hero in the, in my eyes, around person-centred care, and um, Catherine Wilton. Um, all these people uh are, are all being very supportive um, and we're all on the same mission really which is to enable people to take control of their own health and care and have a better experience so sophie um can we come to you sorry i missed your sophie but now's your opportunity where i'm based locally um i'm aware that um a, a group of people have recently been recruited um through the nhs under the job title of health coaches um, but I'm aware that these people are actually untrained individuals and yeah. actually their role is to offer information, advice and guidance around like healthy lifestyles, choices and to do signposting and those sorts of things. And I was just really wondering what your thoughts are about those sorts of people being called health coaches when actually they haven't had any health coaching training or experience. Um, because personally, I'm a little bit concerned about the misuse of um, titles like health coaching because I think it can actually dilute some of the really good work that you're able to demonstrate in the East of England through quite a robust program. Thank you, and um, yes, we agree. <laughs> it's um, it's quite a concern to us as well, and I think the terminology, uh, what what's being asked for now, is you know coming up with proper terminology about this and. The use of the term health coach uh, inappropriately is often an attempt to make a service look more uh, soft or easy. Uh, and I think one of the, the difficulties around it is to, I mean, the antithesis of a coaching approach is telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. And typically that's what we see uh, untrained folk to use health coaching because it sounds like a, a nice way of saying something or calling a service. Um, you know, we're seeing quite a lot of that around the country, and I think it's wrong. Um, but I think it, it, it says something about the idea that people are trying to make care more accessible uh, to, to, to all of us. So I think, yeah, there does need to be some definitional work around this. Uh, at the same level, it, it means that you need to be very critical uh, when you're looking at the research around this. 
So there was a recent study, uh, an RCT uh, in England, which uh, showed that health coaching didn't work. Uh, but in fact, if you look at the methodology underpinning what the health coaching was, it sounds very much like the service that you mentioned. So I think we need to be um, critical uh, and thoughtful about how we interpret uh, evidence, but also how we uh, use language in order to actually um, you know, promote this in the most effective way that we can. I mean, I just like to, I think there is a big terminology uh, problem around this whole area of shared decision making. Um, and uh, um, I, I think, you know, just have that, that sort of critical eye of when people are talking about health coaching, what are they actually talking about? Which is why I think we, we tried in this, in this webinar to um, hopefully not labour on what we thought it was and pull in um, Ruth Woolliver's definition, which I think is the best one so far. So um, I think it's, uh, you can't compare apples and pears in evaluation and it's a really good question. What are you talking about and what is the training that the people have had? Thank you. And, and I think that's really key. So we did some work around um, patient decision aids um, in the renal service with East of England and got very hung up on health coaches who didn't know anything about renal services talking to people who had renal failure. And, you know, it just got all very muzzled about the intention and it was the language that, that uh, distracted things, really. Uh, I would invite you to reach out about it and just connect to, to, um, to find out um, with us maybe offline, uh, but as Penny said before, uh, the intention is to try to make this as widely available to people as possible, uh, and um, you know we'd be very keen on, on looking at how we might do that. Um, there are a range of different training programs, the, uh, ranging from, we found that in general we need a couple of days to help people change what they're doing, but if people are in the actual functional role uh, of being a health coach, uh, you do need to get people to the point where they can, uh, in my opinion anyway, that they're actually qualified in health coaching. So there's a, um, uh, an EMCC, which is the European Mentoring and Coaching Council, foundation level qualification in health coaching that we, we can offer. Uh, and then the other thing is to develop that further uh, into a train-the-trainer model where you uh, resource the system uh, to do that. So it's a very... Um, you know, sophisticated leveling uh, and training uh, um, levels around that. Uh, but it's about what, it's designing things to actually sit, uh, to fit with what's required. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a lot of debate. People say, can you do this uh, on the internet or can you do this on a half day because the clinicians are just so busy. Everyone's flat out. We, we understand that. And the evidence from the states is that it has to be a minimum of two days. Um, and our experience is actually when people come on two days and they say, oh, actually, I wish it was more. It's just finding the two days in such big schedules. And the reason why it needs two days is because it's like learn a bit of theory, practice on each other, learn a bit of theory, practice on each other, so that when you leave the program, you're not thinking, oh, I need to look at my notes. You actually fully understand uh, what is involved. It's very participative. And that is what creates the, the change in thinking about how I approach my patient. It's a change in mindset and belief around what, what we're trying to do here. Uh, we, we're not trying to fix things for everybody. We're trying to fix things for some people, but, and some people just want it fixed. But we're not trying to fix things for everybody, actually. For some people, we're enabling them to help themselves. And that takes two days. So, um, so in answer to your question, please get in touch. Um, use the resources on the website. Andrew and I are happy to um, have a chat with people um, if we can. Um, yeah. It, it, lots of positive comments and observations, um, both Penny and Andrew. So um, you're definitely hitting the target. We might have to do another WebEx, I think, at this rate. Um, but thank you very much indeed. Um, and just to leave the audience with, you know, your last comments and thoughts would be really helpful. So do you want to just say what's the one thing that people can do the minute they get off um, this WebEx? 
Thanks, um, and I'll leave you to think about that for a second. But just to say to everybody, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. I know we've run over, um, but thank you for staying with us. I think it's a fascinating topic that we will come back to, and we'll talk to Penny and Andrew about another date, I think. Um, uh, on the screen now, you'll see the dates of our next session, so our Twitter chat this evening um, please do join us um, on that and the recording from today, we might have to have a listen, listen to that because it was, um, there was a lot of background noise so we might have to redo that for you but we'll, we'll have a little listen to it offline. So back to Andrew and Penny for the last words. What, what are your motivational comments to leave people with? For me, I think it requires a different way of thinking instead of how can I help you it's what is important to you as a person with a long-term condition. Because if we tap into what's important to that person who's sitting opposite us, then they are more likely to feel engaged. So I think it's about what's important to you and really listening well and asking questions. That's, that's, that's the key, and we can, do that. we can do that without the health coaching. Listen well, ask good questions, what's important to the other person. Um, thanks, Penny. I, I would say that um, first off, that um, you know we're all in it together. So there are so many fantastic um, initiatives, all driving towards changing the dynamic that we have with people uh, who utilise health services. And you know we're all we're all users of the health service as much. So uh, I would I would invite people to keep their eye on. You know, what sort of service do they really want to experience for themselves, their families, their loved ones, uh, each other? Uh, and invite them to be curious about really understanding what's important to someone, as Penny said. Um, you know, help people to change the relationship to their problem uh, or their challenge or their health condition uh, is where you're going to actually get a change in how they manage their health. And I think Joanne's just summed that up nicely in the Q&A box of instead of, you know, what's the matter, it's what matters to you, um, which again was a theme that came from Martin's presentation um, on Monday as well. So that's brilliant. I'm going to call this to a close. It's 20 past one. So thank you, everybody. Um, fabulous conversation. We'll definitely have to keep this one going. And thank you to our speakers, Penny and Andrew. It's a, a different environment, but a very powerful one. So um, thank you for, uh, for doing that for us. Um, and I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you very much.